got something a little special tonight that I didn't announce to anyone for a reason, several reasons. But this morning I mentioned to you how the scripture where Jesus came and he's talking to the synagogue, how he came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captives free. And we talked about that this morning and how he was in that, in that church or the assembly of that time. And he, he gave the proclamation and that was his ministry. And I could go around this building tonight and pick anybody out of the congregation and you could stand and you could share a testimony of how God has healed the brokenhearted, how he set the captives free, how he's made people with their lives, such as Melanie and others in this building, that they didn't look good. I'm telling you how God restored them and now they're giving God the glory and the praise. And a lot of you, I could just go all across this building tonight and do that. And you would give testimony. But I wanted Miss Shannon to come and just share just a little bit tonight of what she'd been through in the last several years and what the Lord's done in her heart and life. And I know as a pastor, we prayed for her and we prayed that God would do some wonderful things. And for years, nothing seemed to happen. Nothing seemed to even get inklings that it was anything going on. But the Lord was always active. And then we begin to see, and then we had the final chapter here just a few days ago or a week ago. And I want her to come, Miss Shannon, just come and share tonight, if you will, please. You know, uh, by the measure of some, this may seem like a pitiful story. But what I want you to understand tonight is, is that it is not. It's a story of the power of God and of his unfailing love and of his mercy that is greater than anything that we will ever know on this side of the earth. I had a son, had a little boy. He was just like yours. He toddled and he waddled and he made me laugh and he made me cry and he made me want to beat him. <laughs> and then when he got about 16 years old, something happened. He just got up one morning different. I thought uh, for years I was fighting drugs and alcohol with him. I thought that's what was going on. And I fought and I fought hard. Because there's one thing as a parent that you don't want to see, and that's your sin on your child. When you see the road that you took being played out in front of you in the life of your own child, that's a horrifying thing. And it's an humbling thing. December 22nd of 1996, uh, Josh was 16, and I had grounded him. I was not in church, was not saved. Uh, I had told him that he could not go anywhere without me except to the bathroom. And I held firm to my word. So he wanted to come to here, to church. Uh, to, there was a Christmas cantata. I'd never, I was raised in a, in a different denomination of church, and we didn't have cantatas. I didn't even know what a cantata was. But he, he had a girlfriend that was going to church here, and he wanted, me, he wanted to come to the cantata. Come on, Mama, go with me. You can go with me. You can go with me. Okay, fine, I'll go. So I came, and we were in the old sanctuary at the time. On the fourth row from the left, on the side, after the cantata, and let me say this, it had been 22 years since I had been inside a church and heard the songs of the Christ child. It had been 22 years since I had thought about God wrapping himself in humanity and coming. I had given up in the denomination that I was in because it was a law-based denomination and you had to work. And every time that you made a mistake, you had to get saved again. And by the time I was 14 years old, I'd probably been saved 150 times, no joke. Over and over and over. And at 14 years old, I said, that's it, I'm done. Okay, I can't do this right. I can't get it right. So I'm going to hell and I'm going to have a good time on my way. And for 22 years, I lived that lie. I followed him in here to prove my point that I said you weren't going anywhere. And when I sat on that pew and the choir took the choir loft and they began to sing, something began to happen. 
And my heart began to get soft and, and, and tender, and, and I began to cry. And I thought, what is going on with me? And after the cantata was over, Brother Gary, who I did not know, came up, and he uh, began, you know, to give the altar call and to talk. And the Spirit of the Lord began to talk to me and began to, to tell me he wanted me and he loved me. And I thought, and I told him, I said, Lord, you can't love me. You can't want me. I mean, at that point, I was like the woman at the well. The man I had, I wasn't married to. Now, how, how do you want me? And he continued to tell me over and over, I love you. I love you. And my salvation prayer was, Lord, if you can love me and you want to save me, then save me right here. And honey, he saved me right there. Wow. Right there, he saved me. And when I went home that night, my life was never the same. Never the same. But it was not long after that that a storm began. And I knew... I knew because I sensed that night that I needed shelter. And the storm was within my son. And he began to use and he began to get in trouble and he began to live reckless, crazy things, bizarre things, things that involved jails and prisons and embarrassment after embarrassment. But we continued to pray. And I continued to believe and think that I was fighting drugs and alcohol and a rebellious child. He went to prison whenever he was a little old, more than 19 years old. And for the sake of the audience and the little ears that are in here, I'm just going to tell you that prison is not three squares and a cot and a color TV and you get to do what you want to do. What happened to him in prison is everything that you hear is the horror stories. He lived it. And when he came back home on his 21st birthday, I picked him up outside of Elmore Correctional Facility and I brought him home. But something wasn't right. I didn't know. I thought maybe just because he had been locked up and, and during this time of him being locked up, he had told me what was going on, and when I would try to reach out to a warden to try to get him help, it only made it worse. It only made it worse. So I thought time will help. And I know I see the looks of some of your faces, and I, well, I was here with you. I was here with you. But you see, there's some things that, that we don't know about the people we sit beside or that we worship beside. And, and over this period of time, the Lord just quieted me. He just quieted me with his love. He quieted me. He came home. His mental state was not good at all. It wasn't long um, after he was home before... He wanted to go to an uncle's house in Florida, in Frostproof, Florida, where we had lived, um, to just escape, just to get away, try to start all over again, because most of his peers here knew what had happened to him, and maybe a fresh start would be good. So he did. But then his aunt called me not long after he had been down there, and she told me, she said, something's not right with Josh. He sits and he talks to himself. And I, and, I, and I think I was hearing voices. And he laughs inappropriately. And, and he's strange. He's just very strange. And I said, I noticed that too. And I was hoping it was maybe just, you know, the trauma of what had happened to him. It wasn't long after that, and I got another phone call from her, and she said he's gone. He got on the bus, and he left, and he went to Miami. So... It was a while, a long while, when he was in Miami before I ever heard anything from him. And I finally heard from him, uh, and he had told me that he was living in shelters at the time, and that he uh, just knew that, that there was fame and fortune for him, very grand. 
The next I heard from him was a few months later, I got a medical bill from where he had tried to drown himself in the ocean. And I didn't hear from him and I didn't hear from him. Then within about three months after that, I got a phone call from him. He was in New York City. Greyhound has a program called Homeward Bound uh, for homeless people. If you have a relative in, in a city of your destination that will call them and make the arrangements, they will let you ride a bus home for free. So somehow he got to New York City. And so he was in New York City. He stayed there probably six or eight months. I heard from him occasionally while he was there. But Hollywood called him. And he made it to Los Angeles on a Greyhound bus. And he stayed in Los Angeles probably about six or eight months at that point. And he would call me on occasion. Uh, and I would try to talk to him. And finally this one day I told him, I said, Joshua, something is wrong with your mind. This is not, this is not normal. And at that point he still had enough of his mental ability to understand he was teetering between. And so uh, I asked him if he would come home, and he said no, he wasn't coming home, that if he could ever make it to that sign in Hollywood, then, then that's where his money was at. And I would be proud of him then. He would do something then that would make me proud of him. One morning about 3 o'clock, I was awake, and I couldn't go back to sleep, and I went into the kitchen where I was living at the time, and the Lord took me to the back door, and I was looking out the back door praying, and the driveway ran out through that back door. And so the Lord spoke to me, and I could see him. I could see him as the Lord was talking to me, walking down that driveway. My confirmation, he would come back home. I'd had to leave on business, and while I was gone, I had called home to check and was told that that day, unexpectedly, he came walking down that driveway with a bag in his hand. He had come home while I was gone. So he, uh, he was very sick, very sick. And I had taken him to mental health, and uh, we had him committed. And he stayed committed for almost 21 days. When he came out of the hospital, uh, he, he, he did okay for a little while. He took his medicine for a little while. He stayed with me for a little while. Then within about six months, he was ready to kind of move out on his own. He was working at Pilgrim's Pride. He was processing chickens at night. He could do that. But people were, were making fun of him, and he would come home and ask me if he was insane. People are telling me I'm strange. Am I, am I okay? So, after about six months, he moved out and was living with my niece, with his cousin. He quit taking his medication. And in January uh, 28th of 2005, he boarded a bus again and he left for Los Angeles. On Sunday, the 23rd of 2005, of January, would be the last time I would lay my eyes on him. And it was ugly. It was real ugly. And in the midst of that conversation, the enemy raised his head and said, Mother, where is your God? And I said, He's on the throne where He's always been and where He will always be. Right there. Those were our final words. He left. During that next year, I would have some contact with him. He went, uh, the Greyhound Station is a course uh, in, on San, in San Pedro, on San Pedro Street in Los Angeles, which is on the opposite side, Union Rescue Mission. San Pedro on the back side opens up to Skid Row. So he was stayed on Skid Row for probably about six weeks at that point. And he went into the mission. He would go into the mission. Then he was still able to be around people. 
and he would go into the mission. Now, when he was committed, uh, I didn't tell you this part, but I know that you already know it by now, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He also was manic bipolar and had personality disorders. So he, he was very messed up. Um, when he went into Union Rescue Mission, uh, and it's a faith-based facility, he, uh, the students at Pepperdine University, they practiced the psychiatrists there. They practiced their internship there. They worked with those patients, and so they were working with him. And he was doing fairly okay. He was on medication. But he had begun to come to the place in his schizophrenia that he couldn't be around people very much. So they would let him go and uh, have his breakfast by himself first before anyone else came in to the dining hall. They had a new worker. He was, Josh had probably been there about eight or nine months by this time. I was able to talk with him. I was able to talk with his counselors uh, and know his progress. Uh, it, it looked hopeful, hopeful. At any rate, when he went in uh, that morning to breakfast, there was a new worker in there. She didn't know anything about him. And when he walked in, she jumped his case for being in there whenever he wasn't supposed to be, and he left. He left. She didn't know. I wanted to be mad with her. She didn't know. She le he left. At that point, he was still able to use a phone card. I could hear from him occasionally. 2006 has now come around, and uh, he's left from there, and I haven't heard anything from him. Nothing. Nobody's seen him. Nobody knows anything. A new sheriff took office in Coffee County, and he let me file a missing persons report. And when I filed that report, then uh, because of his counselor that had worked with him at URM, I was still in contact with him. He would put uh, the flyers. I sent flyers to him. He would put them out on lampposts there. Uh, in January of 2009, I got a phone call, and uh, it, it was a gentleman who told me that he thought that the guy that was coming into his business was my son. He saw him on a poster. So he would, when Josh would come in there, he would open his phone, call my number, and lay it down so I could hear him talk. It was him. And he stayed for a while there until one day he saw his picture on a lamppost. And he left. I didn't hear anything from him for over two years. Nothing. Nothing. And then in June of 2011, a friend that he had went to school with saw him in San Francisco. He was very sick. Very dirty. And he had told the friend, he recognized the friend, and he knew who he was at that point. And, and he had told the friend he wanted him to come back with him to his place. He, he didn't realize to start off with how bad it was and that he had a black dog. And he wanted him to come see his black dog and visit with him. And when the friend started walking, he realized he was going into the homeless section. And he turned around and left. But he called a, a mutual friend. And uh, she called me and told me about it. And I called him and contacted him. And he told me what he looked like, how sick he was. Four years will pass. It's December 2015. Heard nothing from him. De December 2015. I, if y'all have ever sat by me, I have a picture in my Bible uh, it, was, it, uh, it was in Josh's Bible whenever I buried him, of, of he and I, at a, a church function. And I wrote my timelines down on the back of that picture. And in December of 2015, I began to pray for a miracle. And I didn't hear anything for an entire year. December of 2016... I would constantly, over the years, 
try to search for him in morgues, unidentified bodies, the websites, searching for him through departments of corrections, Googling, just Googling anything, anything. For, for God's timing, in December of 2016, I hit a mug shot. He had been had an, an, uh, arrested in March of 2015 in Santa Cruz. And I looked at that picture, and I looked at that picture, and I thought, That's, that can't be him. That cannot be my boy. Because he looked like the people that we don't like to look at when we go to big cities. He looked just like them. And I think, y'all, really, that that is whenever reality set in with me of really how he was living. I took a long shot. I called. Told them I'd found a mug shot. Told them that who I was, who he was, and the situation. And I said, I'm just trying to find my son. I'm just trying to find my son. So the first person I talked to said, I can't help you. The second person said, I can't give out that information. And the third person was a woman. And she said, I'm going to help you. And so she, uh, God at this point had begun to finish the weave on the upper side of this beautiful tapestry because all I could see was the underside just the rough stitches and the knots I didn't have a clue how beautiful this was going to be in the end she contacted the arresting officer for him and gave her my phone number and she actually called me I didn't think I would hear from her but she called me and it was uh, a lady named Jenna, and she was just a couple of years younger than Josh. But in Santa Cruz, the homeless population there uh, is, there's so many that there are officers, community officers, who have a certain area that they work. And in that area, they also have social workers who work that area. And they also have mental health workers who work that area because they have to know the the transients that are coming through there and they have to be familiar with them so that they know when one of them or any of them is about to make a turn to hurt someone or hurt themselves. So they were very familiar with my Josh. So I told her my story and uh, she told me, she said, I, I know your boy. <laughs> He's in my area. She said, you do know your son is very sick. I said, yes, I do know that. I do know that. And I said, what I want you to know and what I want you to understand is that he's not been thrown away. He's not been forgotten. I pray for him every day. Every day I pray for him. And I prayed and asked the Lord that he not be another face in the crowd, that he would find mercy in the eyes of strangers, and that God would feed him. And clothe him and protect him. And would not let him cause harm and would not let harm come to him. And she said he doesn't go into shelters. He is too sick. He doesn't go in around people. But she said I every day have learned now that if I bring him food he will take it from me. But he won't go with me to get food. So she said every day I've been feeding him a muffin. She had no idea that was his favorite food. When he was growing up, we used to call him the muffin man. You make six muffins, he'd eat six. <laughs> so God wasn't just feeding him. God was feeding him muffins. She said, uh, he's always good for a hamburger. <laughs> so she said, I always try to make sure when I'm going to be around him, I give him a hamburger. I was able to stay in contact with her 
for probably about maybe two months, somewhere in there. Uh, and so she, she sent me some pictures of him that were very disturbing, very sad. My Josh was 6'5", and in these pictures he weighed about 140 pounds. He was very thin, but he was a walker. Uh, his schizophrenia was one in that he wandered. He could not stay in one place. He didn't sleep in shelters. They don't know where he slept at that point. They didn't know where he slept. She never saw him with a blanket. She, he would wear the same clothes over and over and over and over. And so she finally realized that if she would take him clothes and tell him that she was told to give those to him, he would take it. But she, whatever she gave him, she would have to tell him she was told. Because he, I, from, from what I, I, I understand, he could relate that she was hearing what he was hearing. I talked with his mental health worker. I talked with his social worker. We watched him for a while. The social worker and the mental health worker wanted me to leave a message on their phone. And they wanted to play the message for him to see if perhaps that that would cause some kind of connection. And I had prayed. I had prayed that the Lord would let me be able to tell him that he was not forgotten and to tell him who he was and to tell him where he belonged and to tell him that he was somebody and that more than I had not forgotten him, God had not forgotten him. And I left that message on her phone and I told him whenever I started to hang up, I said, I want you to know one thing. If you'll let me come where you are, I'll walk every mile you walk. Or I'll just sit where you sit. I'll see what you see. But if you don't want me to come where you are, what I want you to understand is, is that I love you. And your name is Joshua. And you have a family. And you have a home. They played the message for him. And she said that uh, the first time that she played it, and when, it, when I, I said goodbye and I love you, he took the phone and looked at the phone. And she said, do you want me to play it again? And he nodded his head and she played it again. And this time he took the phone and he handed it to her, closed his eyes, and then he turned around and walked off. That was it. That was it. My friend Jenna, the officer, she had, uh, had a passion for finding him. Something that she told me that she could not let go of. She said, I couldn't understand it at the time. She said, my husband would get very angry with me because he said, I was obsessed with this guy. What was the difference between him and the other hundreds that were roaming around? What was the difference? She said, I couldn't explain it, Miss Shannon. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't tell him why, I just told him I had to look out for him. Her husband saw him in San Jose just a few months later. And that was the last sighting of him. August the 12th of 2018. I wrote a note on the back of our picture and it said, pray me home. Pray me home. And my mother, when Joshua left in 2005 in January, my mother died that July. Uh, she had dementia. And she, uh, there's not a pretty way to say it, she was absolutely crazy uh, in her dementia. And uh, this was the last days of her life. And she had not spoken, had not talked to anyone in weeks. The brain was that far gone. She just, her bed was down on the floor. That's where she lay while we waited. One Friday night, I was in her room with her in the middle of the night, and I hear this voice. My middle name is Kay, and my family called me Kay. And in the middle of the night, I hear this voice, Kay? And I thought, hearing things. Kay, 
I turned around and her little eyes were open. I got down on the floor and went where she was at. I said, Mother, did you call me? She said, Yes. She said, Joshua was not coming home. I said, I know that, Mom. I told you that. Remember, don't wait for him. He's in California. When Jesus comes, you go. Please don't wait for him. He's not coming home. As clear as I'm speaking, she was that clear that night for that brief moment, and she said, he's not coming home. Promise me you'll bring his body back, and you'll lay him by me. Yeah. I said, I promise. She closed her eyes, and that was it. That was it. She'd live five more days. So all these years, I've heard that in my mind and in my heart. And you know, when the Word says that we, when we pray His will, for all of these 14 years, I could not pray, Lord, Heal him, deliver him, bring him home. I could pray it, I could say it, but I couldn't rock the throne of God with that. And I know a lot of my friends meant, meant well when they would say, He's going to come back, I'm believing God, He's going to come back. And I say, He's not coming back, I'll never bring him back alive. You've got to have faith, sister. But the Lord had told me then. I can't explain that. I can't explain that. Mother's Day of this year. The week before, uh, I bought myself a mother's dress. A mother's Day dress. And I bought myself that dress because I said, you know, if my Joshua were here, he would want me to have this dress. That's how I justified that dress. <laughs> And I painted my fingernails purple and my toenails purple because he liked purple. And I put on all my mama stuff and I came to church. And I'm going to tell you something, ladies. Over the years, there's been many times over the years I've come in this church mad. I'm mad. Because maybe your child got delivered. Maybe... A lot of the times, some of the people he ran with are sitting in the church with their wives and their husbands and their children, and they've lived happily ever after. And there was not a happily ever after for me. And inside of me, I would be mad. But I would say to the Lord, Lord, this is not my cup. So I'm going to drink this cup. I don't like this cup. It tastes horrible. But it's mine, and I'm going to drink. And I'm going to praise you in the middle of it. So after August of 18, I, when I began to pray him home, I began to ask the Lord for mercy. I began to ask the Lord to let me be a little bit selfish in this. I asked him to please let me just have some time with him. I said, Lord, all I want to do is just touch him. I just want to smell him. I don't want him to leave here alone. Please don't let him leave here alone. And God, please don't let his body lay somewhere and rot. That's my son. And Mother's Day, I came into church and I cried for him. On Thursday, before Mother's Day, on the 9th, I lost my sense of smell years ago through sinus surgeries. And so at home, I'll have to ask Greg if something smells good or smells bad or what's it smell like. And, and at work, sometimes Josh Carnley, I work for him. When I first started working there, I'll lighten it up for us for just a minute. When I first started working there, I'd been in an office for about 13 years and I'd not been able to smell fresh air. And I was just cooped up in an office. So bless the Lord, I'd raise those windows. <laughs> I'd get some of that fresh air, and I'd smell hear the tractors going and the birds singing. He walked in this one morning, and he said, do you like the smell of chicken poop? I said, not especially. Do you? No. Why have you got the windows up? So they were spreading fertilizer out there, and I had the whole house, the whole place stinking. <laughs> I said, I can't smell. Yes, you can. You can smell. I said, I cannot smell. I cannot smell. So he's my nose at work. I'll say, Josh, come here and see if this stinks. <laughs> 
So uh, that morning, I woke up and I, I had this smell. It was a weird smell. And uh, I said, Greg, do you smell that? No. I said, it smells funny. And I can't explain what it smells like. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm still smelling that smell. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I'm growing something in my sinuses, you know. Maybe I'm fixing to have another infection. I don't know. I just smell something weird. So I came to the altar on Mother's Day right here. And I kneeled down at this altar. And I told the Lord that day, I said, Lord, I do not want to be bitter. And I don't want to be mad. And I just want you to help me walk through this with grace and to be able to give you glory. I had no idea what was about to happen. No idea. We got in the car and we left. And I get a text that says, take the California call. What is that? I knew it had to be something to do with him. I'm driving, Greg's got my phone, and I said, I don't know what that means. Call, call her back. And I called her, and, and, and she said, they called me, and they won't tell me anything, but here's the number to a hospital in California. Josh has been hurt bad. They need you to call. So I pulled off the side of the road. I made the phone call. And they told me that he was in a, a trauma unit, neuroscience trauma unit. That he was in a dumpster asleep. And the dump truck picked him up and crushed him. And I remember screaming. <laughs> I was mad. A dumpster. My son in a dumpster. And it was all I could do to keep my face turned toward the Lord and not fall apart and not walk away at that point. Not from my faith, but from what I had just asked for. So they told me that he was very grave and that they needed me to get there as soon as I could. They asked me if I could identify him by tattoos, marks on his body. And so I went from the top of his head that I had memorized. I had written everything down over these years. I'd say brushes, I'd saved Toothbrushes, I'd say jackets, just so if I ever had to have DNA, I had DNA. And I began to describe the, the tattoos. And there was a part of me that was like, okay, they're going to tell me this is not him. She came back and she said, ma'am, this is your son. I need you here. The Lord opened doors that we, we had no idea could be swung open that quick and that fast. Within 13 hours, we were by his bed. We got on a flight out of Atlanta nonstop from the time we hung that phone up until the time we were on that plane was about four hours. We got on the plane, and I, I was sitting there thinking, this is not real, this is not real, this is not real. I have got to be dreaming again. And then I began to wonder and to worry, and I said, Lord, what about this and what about that? And the Lord said, I'm already there. I'm already there. Just be still. I'm already there. We walked into that hospital room. And uh, I, I thought I was prepared to see. I thought I was. He was on a vent. He was on continual dialysis. He had tubes into his lungs. His lungs had collapsed. Uh, numerous other things were wrong with him. But, but from that night, from, we got there about 12.30, close to 1 o'clock in the morning. 
And about 3 o'clock, I convinced Greg that he needed to go to a hotel and go to bed because somebody needed to sleep. Somebody needed to have some sense. And it uh, wasn't going to be me. <laughs> so when I got to him and I put my face down to him, I could only get to a certain part of his face. what I had been smelling. So I did what anybody would have done not having seen their child for that long. I touched. I smelt. I talked in his ear. Told him he wasn't by himself anymore. That I was there. I was there. And his eyes would twitch just a little bit as you would talk. And So growing up, he used to love for me to rub between his eyebrows with my thumb when he was troubled or tired. That put him to sleep or or shut his mouth, calm him down. And so I began to rub between his eyes and talk to him. And when I began to do that, he began to kind of wiggle his eyes, kind of move his head a little bit. And I said, it's mama. It's mama. Nobody else knows that. It's me. I enjoyed those hours that I had, not looking or not thinking. I just enjoyed what I had. The doctor came around the next morning and told me that pull the cover off of him, and we went from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He told me that when he came in to the emergency room, when they brought him in, and he had heard that he had been picked up in a dumpster, that he thought that he was high or drunk and had passed out in a dumpster. When they pulled a tox screen on him, his screen was clean. And he said, so I know now he's schizophrenic. And he said, I cannot explain to you why I fought for him like I fought. But he said, I have fought for this young man and fought for this young man. And legally, we had every right not to hold this life support to him. They rallied around someone who was not another face in the crowd. They fought. They searched. They didn't stop. The next day on Monday, he had to go back into surgery again. They'd had to take his right leg off at the knee. He had to go back into surgery on Monday. When he went into surgery on Monday, they had to take the leg off up to the hip. The officer, Jenna, who had been my, my angel and my hope, called and asked if she could come to the hospital. And she came to the hospital. I got to meet her. She got to meet him. She got to tell me stories about him, about how much he walked. And they called him JP because he always had something going on. She said he liked to talk to mannequins. <laughs> she shared some good things, some fun things with me. But she cried with me and Greg. She stayed with us. They, uh, she told me that she would get the report uh, from the 911 call if I wanted it. And I said, I, I do, I want that. I want that, I need to know. But she did better than that. The officer who answered that call called me and asked me if he could come to the hospital. So he did. He told me, told us when he got there, that the call came in on Thursday morning, the morning I woke up with a smell, 529 in the morning. The compactor truck, the garbage truck, had picked up the, the trash bin, the, the dumpster that my Josh was in, dumped it, and crushed it. They made two more stops after that. So he was, he was crushed three times. When they got to the gate, to open the gate, to go in, to, to dump this load in the landfill, where it would have never been sifted through again, they heard him screaming in the back of the truck. So they dialed 911. This officer answered that call. When he got there, he peeled the back, back 
and could see his head, he had managed to keep the upper part of his body on top of that compactor three times. When he yelled in to him and asked him, he said, what is your name? He yelled back and said, my name is Joshua. By the time the fire department got there and they tried to get him out, he'd lost consciousness. When they got him out, they cut his clothes off. and He had a tattoo across his abdomen that said Morgan. So the officer said, okay, maybe Joshua Morgan. So he starts looking, starts trying to figure out who he is. He gets a little bit of a fingerprint on his right finger, and that's what they had to work with. And so it took them from Thursday until Sunday to find out who he was, where he was from, and who could they notify to try to get his family there. He shared every detail. I asked him for everything. I told him, I said, what I do not want is I do not want to be tormented by the enemy for something that, that I, I don't know happened or not. I want to know what happened, and that I can deal with. But I don't want to leave my mind open to make up something that was not real. So he gave us all of it. That Tuesday morning, the, that Monday night after Josh had surgery, he, uh, he had a really bad night, a really bad night. The, he couldn't get enough oxygen. He couldn't, couldn't keep his sats up. He stayed in the 60s. They worked with him all night, trying to move that vent tube around, trying to keep him easy. I would wake up and go back to sleep for a few hours. Sometime before daylight, I woke up, and uh, I, I just woke up knowing. They had told me that they would fight as long as we wanted to fight and as long as he could live, but we would fight. And to start off with, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted him. I wanted whatever part of him I could get. If he had to lay there and be drugged out for days, that meant that was days I could spend with him I hadn't had. But that morning I woke up and I knew that I was being very selfish. And that it's not what he would have wanted at all. And it was just a matter of time because they were going to go back the next day and take the left leg. And then when they took that left leg, that black dying cells, those were moving up into his body because everything from his rib cage down had been compacted three times. There was nothing. So the Lord reminded me in Proverbs of Solomon whenever... The one mama slept on her baby. And she got up and got the other mother's baby. She pretended it was hers and they took him to Solomon. And Solomon said, I, I know what to do. We'll cut this baby in half. And the real mother of the baby said, no, 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 no. Let my child live. I'm, I'm okay. And I gave him to the Lord that morning. I gave him to him. And I told him in that handoff that I knew without a shadow of a doubt that he would be so much better off. And I thanked him that he had given me what I had asked him for. And that was just some time, just some time, just let me see him. So when the doctor came in and I told him that I had had decided to let him go. He said, what I want you to understand is, is that when we pull this vent off, he will die. And I said, what I want you to understand is, is I am confident in his salvation. And I am confident in the Lord. And I am confident that when he takes his last breath from here, his next breath will be in glory. So you pull it. They gave me a couple of hours with him, and then they came in. And they told me when they pulled it, when they pulled the vent, they said he will not live. Once we pull the vent, he will die. So I stayed in the room. I stayed at the head of his bed. They pulled the vent. I heard him gurgle. 
I went around to the bed where he was at, and I sat down on the edge of the bed. By then, they had taken everything off of him where I could get to him. Sat down on the edge of the bed, and when I sat down, I picked his hand up and began to talk to him. And then when I'm talking to him, he done like this and opened his eyes and looked me dead in the eye. And it was that look of like, and I said, it is me. It's your mother. You are not by yourself. You've not been forgotten. But today, today, you've spent your last day on planet Earth sleeping in a dumpster. You've ate from the trash can your last day. And you will not wander anymore because you're going to, when you close your eyes from here, the next time you open them, you're going to open them and you're going to open them into the portals of heaven. This is over. It's over. And I told him not to be afraid. I said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You go. You go fast. You go. Greg would talk to him. Greg told him, all about his girls and about his family. And I told him about him and I told him, I said, you don't worry about me. I'm okay. For once in my life, I have a home. I have a husband that loves me, that takes care of me. And I said, the oldest girl of his, it's not ha-ha funny, she has your birthday. Now, what's that? And, you know, when I realized that, I told the Lord then, I said, no, this is not a trade. This is not a trade. I mean, you don't trade your child for someone else's. But I began to realize the beauty for ashes in this whole story. And I told him, I said, the youngest one, I have made my own real Barbie doll. And I said, I may have overkilled that one just a little bit. But we talked about home. We talked about life. I called him up on his cousins. I had five hours that I got to talk. And then he came in the room. And I knew when he came in the room, he came to get my boy. Because it changed. The room changed. And so I just pulled him a little closer. And I said, he's, he's here, and you're leaving, and I'll see you again. And within just a few seconds, he just, and he left. In glory. It's not a pitiful story. Brothers and sisters, it's powerful. It's 14 years of walking when we cannot see. It's almost 20 years of not knowing what the next phone call was going to be. But knowing that the grace of God was sufficient whenever it came. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. I want to read that to you. I gotta find it first. Can a woman forget her nursing child or lack compassion for the child of her womb? Even if these forget, yet I will not forget you. Look, I have inscribed you in the palm of my hands. Your whales are continually before me. Your builders hurry. Those who destroy and devastate you will leave you. But look up and look around. They all gather together. They come to you as I live. This is the Lord's declaration. And I've stood on that and stood on that and stood on that for years. He was inscribed in the palm of his hand. And when he left, I began to think about those poor Sanitation drivers must have been terrorized from hearing that scream, from not knowing what they had done, not one time but three times. 
And so I contacted the officer and I asked him that day that he was there as well. I said, I want you to let them know something for us. I said, I want you to let them know that that, that was not his cry out of pity. That was his cry home. That if he had not called out, if they had not heard him, that I wouldn't get to be here. Not to be terrorized by this. That it was God's way to get me back to my boy and my boy back home. You know, we can't thank you enough for the prayers, for the help that you gave us through this journey. It's been tremendous. When we got on the plane to come back home, I began to wonder, Lord, how, how will we ever raise, come up with enough money, cash, because I couldn't insure him. He was homeless and schizophrenic to bury him. So I began to try to look within myself as to how I'm going to do it. And the Lord said the same thing to me coming home. He said, going out there, I'm already there. I'm already there. Every penny, every need, everything was provided by the hand of God. And we are graciously grateful to you for being obedient to the Lord to help bring Joshua home. But if there's one thing that I can leave with you before I sit down tonight, I want to leave you with this. And that is never give up. Never give up. When you place your hope in Jesus, you placed it in an eternity that does not fail. For probably close to 20 years, that's the word that the Lord has dropped in my spirit and that I have worked with and lived with and prayed with and sang over and over to myself. All my hope is in Jesus. All of my hope. I hear the word. I obey the word. I pray the word. And I expect the word to return what it has said it would do. I hope. I wasn't wishing. I was hoping. We love you and we thank you.